Um, I'll start people bringing people in. Okay. And then uh, we can then uh, start sharing the slides. So uh, I usually do the magic trick of admitting all if I can find the button. Here we go. So. People should start coming in now, let's hope. Good morning, Simon. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Con. Morning, Steve. Morning, Con. Uh, good morning, Catherine. Good morning, good morning, Padraig. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Andrew. Uh, good morning. Joining. If you've just joined, if you could um, go on mute, that'd be great. Just to cut out any um, background noise, please, that'd be great. Um, I'll monitor the lobby just to see some more people coming in. <clears throat> morning, Sarah. Um, yeah, John's in. Uh, let's just check if we can mute some people. Yeah, uh, Sarah, could you go on mute just to sort of cut out any background noise, please? And I'll, uh, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Um, that's excellent. Uh, let's the box. We've got some more people joining. <clears throat> morning, Paul. Morning, Peter. If you've just joined, if you could go on mute, please, that'd be great. So, um, Paul and Peter, I think if you could mute, that'd be excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, um, it's now 10.32. Um, we are recording, so number one, can we have a thumbs up from everybody that um, we're happy to record? Thank you, Henry. <clears throat> Um, and uh, as usual with Pension Playpen, um, this is a, a great opportunity and we want to welcome uh, Ben Farmer from Hyman's to present on the wonderful world of liquids, which is highly topical at the moment, um, following the mentioned health speech. Um, if you'd like to um, ask a question, as usual, um, please raise a hand uh, and we'll bring you in for interactive comment, which we love. Um, we'll also open up the chat room. Uh, and Ben has already kindly uh, suggested that the slides will be available afterwards if anybody would like a copy. Uh, so, uh, as I say, the meeting is um, recording. Um, I, Andre and Chris will monitor the lobby uh, and make sure we bring a few people in um, and on the last minute. Um, so without further ado, I will pass you over to Ben. So morning, Ben, and uh, over to you. Thanks, Steve, and morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me uh, today. I see a few friendly faces um, and I can only apologise that I'm not quite as salubrious as last week's guests or Steve. And I've watched a couple of the pensions, playpens, uh, coffee mornings before. I prepared 20 or 30 minutes worth of slides, but uh, please do interrupt me as, as we go. And I think it's very polite here and everyone raises their hand. I'll keep a watch because if you just sit back and let me present, it could be very quick and and uh, and possibly monotonous for you. Um, I can also see there's some subject matter experts in the room that do illiquid assets as their day job. I'm a consultant by trade, so this is only one part of my role. Um, so feel free to chime in if you are one of those illiquid experts uh, and, and you know we can engage in a more detailed discussion. So when I was put forward to speak today, Steve gave me carte blanche to pick any topic that particularly grabbed my interest and um, after quickly writing off the upcoming Rugby World Cup as not appropriate material, two things really jumped out for me. So first of all, you know, we had the Mansion House speech uh, delivered by Jeremy Hunt. One of the key areas of that was illiquid assets. So it feels very pertinent for the pension industry today. And um, secondly, at Hyman's, we've been banging on for quite some time now about the importance of planning for your scheme's end game, uh, whether that's some sort of risk transfer with an insurer or runoff uh, and self-sufficiency. And that feels particularly relevant now, uh, both because of a big pro um, proportion of that is illiquid assets and, and planning your investment strategy for your end game. Um, and then also some schemes are just materially closer to some sort of end game from a funding perspective than they were, say, 18 or uh, 18 months or two years ago. So with that intro, what exactly are we going to cover today? Um, I've got an agenda on the screen here. 
first of all, we'll do a quick. Re uh, yeah, sorry, Henry, on you go. Sorry, just to mention, you didn't mention super funds. Uh, as a possible option for Endgame, yes, of course, super funds, uh, no offence intended by omission. So agenda for today, uh, we will do a quick recap on illiquid assets. We'll look at what's happened in markets over the last wee while and the impact this has had on DB scheme investment strategies. We'll look at the role that illiquid assets have to play for DB schemes going forward and some of the things that you need to think about when you're allocating to these asset classes. Spoiler alert, like I've said already, you know, one of the key things when you're thinking about your illiquid allocation is your end game, whatever that may be. And so I'll spend a bit of time articulating why that's important and how you can plan for it. And then finally, we'll just do a quick wrap up at the end and sum up some of the key messages covered. Now, uh, being an actuary by trade, I feel it's important to include all of the risk warnings and disclaimers. So first of all, none of this is specific investment or actuarial advice. And I'm conscious this is being recorded. I don't want to get in trouble with my compliance team. Um, and then second, you'll have heard me use the phrase DB schemes uh, an awful lot, even just in the intro. My day to day focus is solely on defined benefit schemes and their investment strategies. So that's what this presentation will concentrate on throughout. Um, I'll not be much use to you if you're looking for detailed answers on all things DC, but I know there are experts on the call. So um, I'm sure we can handle any DC questions as they arise between us. How does that all sound? Any questions? All good. Nodding heads. Brilliant. So first things first, what do we mean by illiquid assets? Um, and again, apologies to the experts at this who eat, sleep and breathe this every day, but thought it was important to do just a quick recap on what illiquid assets are and where they fit into that UK DB investable universe. Always good to start with the definition. So um, I looked online, illiquid assets are those that cannot be quickly or easily converted into cash for their fair market value. Um, and I thought that was quite neat. Uh, you know, for me, illiquid assets involve locking up your capital for the long term, acknowledging you mightn't be able to get your money out quickly or easily. And because you're locking it away for the longer term, you expect to get a higher return on your investment in exchange for that lock in period. And that phenomenon is sometimes referred to as the illiquidity premium. Now, often illiquid assets are associated with a sort of combination of factors that uh, can contribute to their illiquidity. So things like you know, limited supply, barriers to entry, things like high transaction costs, um, if they're complex or complicated investments, or if they're associated with high risk. Now, the chart I've put on the screen here just sets out the UK DB investable universe, according to Ben Farmer in 2023. So again, no uh, offence intended on any omissions. Um, and it's, I've tried to sort the asset classes by sort of risk return and liquidity profile. So assets move from the bottom left uh, to the top right in terms of low risk, low return to the more racy stuff. Uh, and, and I've tried to color the blobs according to their liquidity. So green blobs indicate highly liquid, blue is somewhere in the middle uh, and then pink denotes illiquid assets. And I did start trying to be clever uh, and, and do the size of blob by broadly the size of the opportunity for pension schemes. Very quickly ran out of space um, and, and some of the blobs were too small and things. So it's more about just fitting everything in in a visible uh, in a visible way. Lots of um, acronyms here. Not going to go into them in any detail, but happy to pick up any questions on on if you or if you disagree with how I've allocated certain things. I think the important thing for me is this chart would have looked very different if we'd taken a snapshot sort of 25 or 30 years ago. As for most schemes, you would have had like five blobs. So uh, you would have had your gilts and your linkers on the bottom left. You would have had listed equity with a big UK bias, corporate bonds, investment grade, again, largely UK focused, 
and some property for a bit of extra return and diversification away from your equity holdings. So that then begs the question, well, why have DB schemes been allocating more to illiquid assets in the past 25 years? And what's happened more recently to bring these assets into, into sharp focus? Well, I've got a chart on my next slide, I think summarizes that quite nicely. So this slide really just looks at what's happened in markets over both the long term and then the last sort of 12, 18 months that's really brought illiquid assets back into focus. Now, for the past, well, 20 odd years, but particularly the last 10 years, going back uh, to the global financial crisis, we've had an era of cheap money, things like record low interest rates, really low inflation, falling government bond yields, as you can see from that chart on the left hand side, the particularly around the light blue circle there. And so this phenomenon of, of cheap money, low yield, uh, that saw institutional investors allocating more to alternative assets. And many of those alternative assets are a liquid. Um, and they were allocating more to these alternatives to generate the excess returns required to close funding gaps in DB schemes or often to generate cash to help pay benefits as DB schemes became more mature and more cash flow negative, where they had more money going out in benefit payments than they did in, in money coming in uh, in contribution income. Then we come to 2022 and, and the, the pink circle, and there was an awful lot of focus on gilt markets in 2022, as this trend of falling yields reversed. Now at first, it unwound in a pretty controlled way in the first half of 2022, and then gilt yields spiked really sharply in, in September. All the stuff around trussonomics and uh, everything else. Look, it was a pretty engaging time for trustees, consultants, uh, and, and scheme sponsors alike. So to help put some numbers on the, the impact of all of these market movements, I've just set out a table of asset class returns over both the long term so the 10 years to the end of 2021, and then looking at 2022 in isolation, and the, sorry, the long-term returns are annualized for ease of comparison. Um, and we've looked specifically at the asset classes that UK DB schemes typically invest in. So your equities, property, corporate bonds, and UK government bonds. Now, what are the key takeaways from the table? Well, over the 10 years to the end of December, 2021, you had really positive returns from the vast majority of the asset classes that DB schemes are holding in, in their asset allocation. And that's despite things like a global pandemic, or fairly meaty market wobbles over that period. And then you had the 12 months to, to um, 2022, uh, where you know most of the asset classes held, sold off, and in some cases, really sharply. These market moves were significant and um, had really material implications for DB scheme investment strategies. And so that's what we'll look at in you know, how those investment strategies changed over the period uh, in more detail on the next slide. So what has happened to DB investment strategies in recent times? Well, the charts on the left hand side of this slide, I've, I've just set out the actual asset allocation of one of my schemes um, over the course of 2022 to show how this changed in the wake of market movements that we talked about on the previous slide. So top half, you had the position at the end of 2021. You had a, about 20% of your assets were invested in illiquids and we were actually underweight to the scheme's benchmark allocation at that point in time. And we were thinking with the trustees about ways of topping that up or maintaining the allocation back up to the benchmark. You also had about 45% of your assets invested in liquid return seeking, so listed equities, DGFs, property, um, sorry, properties in the illiquids. And, uh, then about 35% of your assets in LDI, and that was providing your liability hedging and cash to help pay the benefits. 
and they were hedged just about to funding level on a quite prudent basis. So 70% hedged. And I, I picked this scheme because I, I wouldn't say it was atypical at the time um, f- for a DB scheme in that uh, funding position. Fast forward to the end of 2022, you're now significantly overweight to liquid assets. And as part of that, you know, we can the plans to top up the portfolio uh, with, with new money. We had significant sales in the liquid return seeking assets over the year to maintain the LDI portfolio and their liability hedging arrangements. And we also reduced the hedge ratio uh, back a bit just so that we weren't putting undue stress onto the, the collateral that they had. So like, you know, quite meaty changes to the asset allocation over the period. And there's some things to note that aren't actually captured by the charts. So I'm sorry, I am realise I keep flicking to the left, but that's where I've got the slides on screen. Um, so um, not captured by the charts, you know, we had the pound amount of assets fell dramatically. So they were a hair off a billion quid at the end of 2021. They were thinking about TCFD um, and instead they ended 2022 at about 500 million uh, and the liabilities fell by uh more than that quantum on a prudent basis their funding position actually improved over that time um if you so i focused on the changes of actual asset allocation um if you were to look at the changes in strategic benchmark there is no you know it's not as obvious a trend and actually they had the same strategic benchmark asset allocation at the end of 2022 as they did at the end of of 2021 um, and there were significant limits on the degree. So like most schemes, um, we had a or have a, a rebalancing policy in place where we'd look to move back to benchmark periodically. In this case, we look at it quarterly or if the, the asset allocation gets way out of whack with benchmark. But there was limits on the extent to which you could usefully rebalance just to liquidity um, and, and things like the you know, changing regulations on um, what your LDI portfolio should look like. And that's where this um, diagram on the right hand side comes in. And thanks, you know, oh my thanks to LGIM for this, but, you know, other LDI managers are available. I mentioned before the guidance and the regs on LDI collateral. Um, now, these were published in November 2022 and they brought sort of new or renewed focus rather on the liquidity of DB scheme assets. So from a practical perspective, the regulator wanted trustees to document where assets would be sold down to top up their LDI collateral and have a clear picture of um, when you know you needed to submit instructions, when that cash would settle so that everything was in place to move quickly if you needed to. Then more fundamentally, the guidance and regs changed what LDI portfolios look like. So previously, you know, um, private sector DB schemes would have had LDI portfolios anything up to three or or even four times levered. And I've anecdotally, although not seen it myself, um, heard of schemes running at five, even six times levered. So for every pound invested in the LDI portfolio, you were hedging three, four, five pounds worth of liabilities. Um, And typically you would have looked to have enough collateral to withstand about a 200 basis point rise in guilt yield. And again, heard of schemes running closer to the wind than that, but I haven't seen it myself. Now, TPR, the Bank of England, the Bank of the Central Bank of Ireland and the Central Bank of Luxembourg all stepped in and introduced this new regulation where schemes had to target a higher level of LDI collateral sufficiency. And that was just to make sure that if we did see significant market moves like um, we saw in September 2022, you wouldn't have the same fire sale or doom loop as they referred to it, where everyone was trying to sell assets to top up their LDI collateral positions. Um, And this, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Ben, just said Andrew Stork has raised a hand. So, Andrew, do you want to unmute and just quickly raise a question? And then we'll come to Con Keating, who's also made a question in the chat. But, Andrew, you go first with your hand raised. Yeah, sure. It's more of a point, actually. I mean, talking about this all the six times on LDI, I, I think, to be fair, well, or from my experience, the six times tend to be where you've got different buckets of maturities. So, the six times may have been applied to the sort of naught to five years. 
but yeah. probably wouldn't have been applied across the whole the whole structure here, the typical 20 years, because uh, as you say, that would be pretty, pretty scary. Yes, too, a bit punchy. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally okay. agree. And Con. Uh, yeah, Con, do you want to unmute um, and just ask your question, Con? This is likely to break up because I've got a very dodgy Wi Fi connection. I can hear um, you loud and clear, Con, don't worry. The, um, uh, it uh, comes from being on holiday in the States. What I'm interested to know is the reallocation of to illiquids. How much of that is dependent on the valuation? What, were, what was the value of the illiquids at the end of the year relative to the beginning? Yeah, so the illiquids actually ticked along very nicely in this case for this scheme. So they don't hold any private equity. Um, it's all various types of illiquid credit. So commercial real estate debt um, and direct lending primarily. And it all ticked along very nicely, um, sort of cash plus four to six return over the year. Uh, I, so there is a big denominator effect at play here where all the listed assets fell in value as mm -hmm. per the, the table of returns we showed. And um, sort of stealing my thunder a bit from what I'm going to say in, in one of the slides coming up, Con, but you know we don't, a lot of schemes we heard of were sort of slavishly adhering to rebalancing or, or maybe were, it, were forced to given the degree of illiquidity they had in their schemes, but they were having to sell illiquid assets or choosing to at significant haircuts to NAV. Um, yeah. Whereas in our view, it, it's better to acknowledge that you won't be able to do anything sensible in terms of rebalancing in the short to medium term. Let those positions run and let your liquid assets mature and, and take the cash coming back to you as long as it's yeah. not you know, under duress. Yeah, my problem is I think that's very dangerous territory. I mean, I heard of illiquids which traded literally at 40, as low as 40% of the NAV at the beginning of the year, although that was actually a piece of crap. Um, but if you are not marking your asset, your, your illiquid assets to markets, albeit that they are distressed markets, um, I think you're mismarking your portfolio. Yeah, but um, you, know, you can talk about that later if you like. Well, no, I think the so the lags in uh, pricing for illiquid assets is well trailed, and that's one of the things I'll touch on briefly later on. Um, I, I do think that investing in illiquid assets, you know, whilst the asset class has lots of attractive characteristics, uh, or, or be it private equity or private debt, just in general, um, it is very cyclical and you have to be cognizant of those lagged valuations. You can't just pile your money in ahead of, a, depending on where you are in the economic cycle, uh, you have to go in with your eyes open. Agree. Yeah. Okay, well, probably just a good point. Um, pause for breath and pick up any other questions while we're or I can just crack on. No, I think uh, uh, we'll monitor Fire that right. and keep going, but thanks for your question, Con. So yeah, keep keep going, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. So well, LDI portfolios fundamentally changed. They're now targeting um, much greater collateral buffers, so they're better protected if things do head the same way, albeit personal view here, I don't think anything has been done to address the systemic risks. So you've just sort of shifted the problem higher up. Uh, LDI portfolios still made of lots of the same stuff, gilts, index linked gilts, cash. The collateral is typically invested in high quality, low duration credit. Um, if you know, I don't think there's been a dramatic shift in DB investment strategies. So Lots of the investors will, if, if guilt yields were to spike 50 basis points in, in a day or, or something like that, you would see this similar trend in terms of selling from DB schemes. It's just that it's not as close to the bone and you're not worried about uh, 
you know, threatening your hedging position and things. So new world for LDI. And as part of that, there's this much greater focus on liquidity. And if you think of your assets in the three buckets as LDI, liquid, non-LDI and illiquids, then that greater focus on liquidity of your strategy has implications for the degree to which you can invest in illiquid assets. And then by extension, things on a practical level like your rebalancing policies, your strategic benchmark and things like that. Um, one other trend that hasn't been captured anywhere on this slide is that funding positions have often improved and for some it's been significant because if you're valuing your liabilities on a gilts using gilt yields, gilt yields have risen. You typically haven't been fully hedged if you're in a, a standard UK DB scheme. So your assets have fallen by less than the value of your liabilities. All of that has implications for your investment and funding strategies. So things like you might now have a shorter investment horizon. You might have a change in your contribution schedule. So you need more cash flow to be generated to um, offset reductions in contributions now that you're better funded. That all feeds through into question marks around the degree of liquidity you need, how much cash you're going to need to generate on an ongoing basis. And that all for me has implications for the role of illiquids going forward. And just what might that role be? Um, I think two uh, pictures sum this up quite nicely. And one of them speaks very much uh, to Con's point. Um, first of all, our view at Hyman's is that illiquids definitely have a role going forward. Um, and I wouldn't fire sale at any price in the short term or even in the medium term to slavishly rebalance to your strategic benchmark. And that's summed up by don't throw the baby out with the bathwater on the left hand side. Then longer term, so short term to medium term, uh, think about the role that your liquids have to play. Um, you know, for the long term, these assets have been doing what they've said on, on the tin in pretty benign economic conditions. Uh, to paraphrase, Con, do deep dive reviews and make sure what you're holding in your underlying portfolio isn't crap. Um, that notwithstanding, once you're comfortable with the quality of the underlying assets, um, like let them run, let them run off, let the money come back to you as planned. We were seeing discounts uh, being quoted on core UK property of NAV minus 20 to 30%. When you actually went to transact, it, um, they weren't even transacting at those prices. It was more likely into the 30s uh, discount to NAV. I heard of private equity portfolios being quoted at 50p in the pound. Um, private debt, opportunistically, this you know this stuff is high quality credit, albeit small, medium sized businesses. When you look under the bonnet, but being quoted at 80p, 70p in the pound, um, and it's short duration, so not reflective of the fundamental risk profile whatsoever. Longer term. I've said these, you know, illiquid assets definitely have a role to play, albeit that will depend on schemes specific circumstances here. So they can be an important part of the jigsaw. Hence the picture there. From a fundamental standpoint, illiquid assets continue to have lots of attractive characteristics and um, thinking specifically on the sort of illiquid credit side, you know, you're you're you have significant income generation. Uh, you've generating a good excess return above liabilities. Often they're floating rate by nature, so perform well in a high interest rate uh, environment relative to fixed interest assets. But couch that against uh, the practical constraints. And before I go into the practical constraints in more detail, Henry, did you raise your hand or will I crack on? I'm very sorry. I, I just thought I recognised the the child in the Punani adverts. <laughs> uh, well, so I will have to take that feedback and go back to our marketing team and see where they've got the furu from. Um, so practical constraints. Fundamentally, we think uh, illiquid assets are still have an important role to play for DB schemes. 
But you have to think about things like your return requirement or your risk appetite. So do you need to take as much risk or do you need as much return as you did before if your funding has improved? Think about your cash flow needs. Is investing in illiquid assets suitable or do you need more liquidity for ad hoc cash requirements in the short term if your contributions have reduced, for example? Coming back to your LDI collateral, can you maintain an illiquid asset allocation and have enough LDI collateral to hedge your liabilities as much as you'd like? And if the answer is no, then which of those two is more important to you at, at your stage in your in your journey? Um, speaking of journey, what's your investment horizon? Do illiquid assets potentially lock you in and lock up your capital beyond the point at which you're aiming to reach your buyout? Uh, runoff or super fund um, end game target date. And speaking of end game objective, whether that's a risk transfer exercise, um, going into a consolidator or a super fund or runoff for self-sufficiency, are illiquid assets compatible with that aim? And some anecdotes from me on this. So one rule of thumb I come up or we, I should say, it's not a formal Hyman's house view, but a few of us have kicked the tires on it. And a sort of sensible private sector DB scheme, rule of thumb for a liquid asset allocation might be at max 30% of your non LDI assets could be invested in illiquids. And that will just reduce organically um, as you de risk your scheme and are increasing your um, weighting to things like LDI. And the other point to make is so semi illiquids so the blue blobs from my original chart of the asset classes and and you know, there, there are other um things like timberland for example aren't included on the chart but would fall into this bracket and have a positive climate and, and net zero aspects as well but these asset classes with, where your liquidity is sort of quarterly or six monthly they wouldn't quite be classed as um, illiquids the way a closed ended fund might, but uh, you're still locking up your capital to some degree. We think those have an, an important role to play here too. Did I see a question pop up in the chat? Simon, thank you for your question. Corporate D, uh, question relates to corporate DB schemes moving to buyout. Do you see pension risk transfer providers taking illiquidity in specie onto their annuity book? I believe only one of the five larger buyout insurers does this currently. I think the emphasis there has to be on currently, Simon. So um, if you looked back three years, even the answer would have been, I don't know the exact time scales, but as far as I'm aware, they didn't take, none of the bulk annuity providers took any illiquids whatsoever. Um, and even then, they were reticent to take anything other than cash and uh, really high quality investment grade corporate bonds that perfectly aligned to the portfolio they wanted to hold. I think as you see increased competition in the market, both between pension schemes that are ready to go to risk transfer and insurers competing for the business, they will become more and more flexible um, in what they're willing to take, they will invest, pardon the pun, the time to look under the bonnet and see the, char the characteristics of the illiquid assets and whether they fit. Because um, often what's happening is pension schemes are selling down illiquid assets or letting them run off, holding cash, passing cash to an insurer who then takes the cash and buys their own portfolio of illiquid credit assets. That seems very inefficient to me. So um, naturally, it's an area of grit in the system that will be removed over time. Secondly, do you think the LTAF initiative and launch of private debt funds in this new vehicle will help late stage end game DB plans as well as DC savers to maintain exposure to private debt whilst having an option to source liquidity? Well, I don't know if you asked that before I made the point around semi liquid assets, but I think that's just a step sort of in that direction where you're making these um, assets that give you that premium for locking away your capital, but uh, with greater access, and and that that is only going to increase in my my humble view. One of the advantages of super funds is that they can efficiently hold private and illiquid assets. From Andrew, yeah, I totally agree, and I think that's um, 
one of the key things that the Mansion House speech was hinting towards, I think they were looking at it from the view of increased consolidation economies of scale and their thoughts around how the PPF could evolve. But totally agree. Um, you, you, you're hoping that or one of the key things they're aiming for is increased access to these sort of um, these sort of assets over the long term. All good. So um, that was a, a sort of whistle stop tour of what we at Hymans and I think um, on a more personal basis are the role of the liquids going forward. I said before, one of the key things in determining a suitable allocation for liquids is your chosen end game, whatever that may be, and how close you are to that. Well, that leads me nicely to my next slide, which just looks at um, when you've picked your end game, how can you appropriately plan for it from an investment perspective? Now, I said before, Hymans has been thinking uh, for some time or, or harping on, if, to, if you like, uh, about the importance of setting an end game objective beyond just full funding on TPs or even thinking about, well, once I hit full funded on a prudent basis, what am I going to do or what's the plan? Whether that's buyout, super fund, consolidator or runoff. And it's really important to plan for that well in advance. Now, um, shameless plug here, but Hyman's relatively recently published a guide on planning your journey to buy out. And that covered the key components of this process from our perspective at a high level. Um, and if it would be of interest to you, just drop me an email after the session and I can send you on a link or the PDF. But for now, the headlines are set out in this matrix on the left hand side of the slide. I'm an investment consultant by trade, so naturally I'm going to focus on the investment strategy planning aspect. Um, and so that's what is summed up by some handy pictures on the right hand side. So if you imagine here we are today in July 2023 and our pension scheme articulates an end game of wanting to do X in 2033 right now. I say do X because you could do a buyout with an insurer, you could move into a consolidator or you could decide that you want to be so well funded in 2033 that you can run off the scheme without any further recourse to the sponsor with a low risk insurer type investment strategy. For us, there, there are three steps in planning your investment strategy at a high level. First one is the hammer and that's you, you know your initial big picture work. So thinking what your end game portfolio would look like and planning how to get there from your current asset allocation and you would do that sort of five to ten years out from your target making sure then that all of the investment decisions you make over that five to ten year period are in service of your objective and, and you know give you a framework and a plan to work towards this involves things like setting de-risking triggers you, you might disinvest from certain asset classes that are not compatible with your end game objective, whatever it might be. And the three th key things for me to focus on here are the degree of liability hedging that you want to have in place, um, exposure to sensible low risk assets. So things like high quality credit that might help you pay the benefits um, or might be attractive to your chosen end game, be that a consolidator or an insurer if you're looking to pass it across and liquidity. Um, so making sure you have enough cash and a wee bit more to pay the benefits as they fold you and meet any ad hoc requirements you might have. Then you've the chisel. So this is where you're refining your investment strategy uh, as you get closer to your end game target and date. So if you're targeting buyout, for example, then how do you make your asset or even if a consolidator, although I don't know it has the same competitive tensions, just yet um but if you're targeting a buyout then how do you make your scheme and your asset allocation as pretty as possible for the insurers to get that best price uh, that you can typically you do this work sort of one or two years out from target and you look at all your portfolios in more detail things like tidying up your derivative portfolios a deep dive on your credit assets to 
high quality and the sort of char characteristics that an insurer or a consolidator might like to be passed over. And the aim is to make your assets as easy to sell or pass over as possible and, and really neaten your portfolios. And lastly, the lock. Um, so like that typifies an, an asset lock either with an insurer or I'm sure a consolidator would do a similar thing where they're pricing your pension scheme based on a line by line breakdown of specific assets. Typically, again, it'll be based on gilts, index linked gilts that are used to value the liabilities and some mix of cash and possibly corporate bonds as well. Um, and so you would, this is as you're approaching a transaction and you want to minimize the risk as far as possible of uh, not having the premium to pay at the point of transfer. So you're really closely aligning and, and really refining your strategy. And I see we've had a comment in the chat from Chris. You mentioned a 30% max of non-LDI assets invested in illiquids. What proportion of schemes are at that level already? I.e. how much additional allocation do you expect to illiquids in the future? Um, okay, so taking a step back, the the sort of 30% rule of thumb was for corporate DB schemes. Um, I notice on the call there are some folk from the LGPS, so I, yeah, hi Jim. I'll couch so I'll couch my um, answer in corporate DB scheme terms. I think the LGPS is a different kettle of fish. Uh, lots of LGPS schemes are currently allocating increasingly to alternative assets, including illiquids, and so those allocations are likely to grow um, in future as they seek more diversification, more varied sources of returns. I don't know if, if you can speak anecdotally, Jim, if that is reflective of your experience or just a thumbs up. Thumbs up, yeah. And then <laughs> corporate DB schemes, um, they're in a different world altogether. In terms of the rule of thumb, so I advise six pension schemes that would fit this criteria. Uh, of them, about a third are at that level. Um, another one is so close to their end game, they are uh, like effectively in runoff. They won't be allocating any more to liquids. And in fact, another one's not far off that. So say a third are are not going to be in, allocating any more to liquids. And then the other two are either actively increasing their allocation or thinking about it with a view to doing so in the next six to 12 months. So sorry, Chris, I don't know if that's helpful, but um, anecdotally, a third, a third, a third, you could say uh, already there, no interest in allocating more to liquids and um, considering doing so. Chris, do you want to unmute and uh, confirm you're happy with that answer or? Yeah, thanks. No, that, that's that's helpful, Ben. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, just an interesting question. I recall sort of speaking to one of your uh, peers sort of actually before the trustonomics uh, 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 hiatus last year, and they were talking about the fact that, you know, if you were looking at a scheme, you know, which had an end game, which was even you know six or seven years away you know allocating to a liquids even to even to debt strategies you know by the time it takes a couple of years to actually get allocated and then to your point when you get to that lock point you're thinking about actually coming out of those investments because you don't get necessarily proper value from the insurer it's a bit like you've only got a couple of years for you know the benefits of the investments relative to liquids to really kick in so they were Kind of having a conversation around well, what's really the point of this um you know particularly if it's investing in sort of closed end funds um you know which which have you know five or six year um you know time horizon so you know i think i think it's just an interesting point to think about and i think your point around look the ltaf and maybe that allowing for for greater liquidity allows schemes potentially to pick up you know that additional yield that they probably want because they've got the pension payments to think about but gives them a, an out which is quicker than some of those funds so it's just you know it's just an interesting you know an interesting question to to ask at the moment given given where schemes have found themselves now and well i think you've raised a really good point 
uh, there, Chris, with the the industry is constantly evolving, right? I mean, if you think back 25, 30 years, investment strategies were much more simplistic than they are today as the needs for DB schemes have evolved. So too have the products, pardon me, and strategies offered by the industry. And I think that's only going to continue. And one area where that is likely to be is how can we access liquids more effectively and to, you know, with the big drive on the DC side to get access to those higher returns in funds that need daily dealing, well, that's going to have knock-on implications for DB strategies as well, where they'll take the lessons learned and apply them in the in the DB space. I think. But yeah, and I was just uh, saying that's the you know that's the point. You're, you're seeing more people in in private or illiquids offering open-ended as opposed to closed-ended funds with more liquidity. And of course, you've got the move towards, you know, tokenization um, because of the blockchain as well. So those things, to your point, you know, innovation in uh, in accessibility. But um, you've actually really nicely sashayed into my next slide with the point around if you're seven or eight years away from your end game objective, why would you invest in closed-ended illiquid funds? Well. I think there's a stepping aside from the innovation point for a second, even in the here and now, there are options available to pension schemes and trustees for dealing with your allocation to illiquids um, that are often overlooked or, you know, you're just thinking, well, I'm not going to allocate to illiquids, I'm too close and I don't want to have to face the fact that it might extend or there's all the risks associated with not being able to get my money back when I need it. And before I go into the options that you actually have available to you to explore, um, I would just couch this all by saying this assumes sensible market conditions, right? And I'm back to September, October of last year when we were seeing NAV minus 20, NAV minus 30, NAV minus 50 being quoted when opportunistic buyers were acknowledging there were distressed sellers in the market. There was chum in the water, uh, if you like. Previous to this, we have the structural change of corporate DB schemes de-risking over time as they mature. They've been holding illiquid assets for the medium to long term, and uh, it's likely that in sensible market conditions, they will be looking to exit some of these as they get towards their end game. That all said, how can you do that in practice? Well, we've set out some of the options here on the slide. You can hold it to maturity, and that would be Point number one, uh, if it's doing what it says in the tin, leave it be, don't mess around with it. Take the cash as it's coming back to you, use it to pay the benefits as they fall due. Um, if, if the maturity point and your desired end game date misalign, so say you're aiming 2027, but you're not getting back, cash from your liquids till 2030. You have options. Um, we've seen uh, corporate sponsors taking them on to the balance sheet. You, you've got deferred premiums to your insurer where you, you pay the bulk of it up front and then a small tail at a later date when the cash has come back to you. Um, you can, uh, escapes me at the minute, but I have one or two other anecdotes that I forgot to write down. But like there are ways to facilitate holding your assets to maturity and avoiding a fire sale when the time comes. Um, I spoke about the LGPS there. They're a very willing investor in illiquid assets and alternative assets more widely. Um, they're one, you know, they're a willing buyer in the market and you have insurance schemes, uh, sorry, big insurers, bulk annuity providers included that are investing in these assets. So there is lots of appetite out there. You can sell via broker um, to any one of those investors. So the third point on the green arrow, we've seen this a few times where either the manager of the closed ended fund takes the uh, assets back onto their balance sheet or sells to another investor within the co-mingled fund who is wish, uh, wishing to increase their allocation, and that can be facilitated in an efficient way. Or as I said, uh, already you could sell it to your scheme sponsor. They take it onto the balance sheet if they have the risk appetite to do so. 
And all of these are just geared towards not taking a significant hit on the valuation. Hori, you've a, got a yeah, raised sorry, hand. Yeah. My apologies if you covered this already. I'm still full of cold and um, it's a bit deaf in one ear. Um, You've covered, you've covered what the options may be for schemes. Are you suggesting that because there is greater appetite from those schemes that remain open and potentially from other financial institutions, that the secondary markets are becoming a, a, a bit stronger, a bit more mature, and therefore, although you've mentioned the word fire sale many times, perhaps it may not be quite the disaster to go to the secondary market for things like selling off bits like private equity? It's my first yep. question. Is that is that is that a fair assessment of what you were saying? So um, yes, in short, and early <coughs> in 2022, late in 2021, I have seen that in practice where the discount to NAVs were eminently sensible, both in quotation and transaction. Then we saw complete dislocation uh, in sort of the middle of last year, where you had hedge funds buying stuff up at pence in the pound because they because they could um and and it wasn't just for illiquid assets that was for high quality liquid credit as well and i think what you're seeing now tentatively i say uh, and and over the medium term you will see it is a sensible secondary market restored um where transactions can be carried out at mutually beneficial and sensible levels okay and Another thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, I've seen other people suggesting that insurers will take assets on. I heard this for years. I mean, it was also when I was a trustee, it was something that was discussed furiously with um, those that we were talking to for, for, for buying. But the point being, when there's so much, there's so much capacity in, or so little capacity in the market and there's so much demand, why the hell would insurers take it on? If it's not completely going to fit with them, this is just a promise, is it, to con try and convince schemes to take on, not yourself, obviously, but other people that may be offering third party services to to consult on this very difficult uh, time for, for many schemes as they approach buyout or buy-in. Yeah. So um, we and I would never <coughs> suggest an in-specie transfer as the base case if you can manage to get it, it is an incredibly nice to have. It's very efficient mm -hmm. from a transaction cost perspective. Sure. Um, but when we talk about insurer friendly assets, it's more investing in a way that minimizes your pricing risk, if you want to call it that. So the risk that your the assets that the investor is ultimately the insurer is ultimately going to hold to back the bulk annuities. And, the, and therefore use that to price your liabilities, you want to invest in a way that is consistent with that so that you're not seeing big swings in your buyout deficit. If you can, in specie, anything across other than cash to, to the insurer, then great. I think that's a really positive outcome, but I, we would never rely on it or say that's the base case. And I think anyone that does is uh, gratuitous. Um, you're, so you're totally right, Porig. Like, it, cash is king for insurers uh, without wanting to be trite. Um, and anything else is a bonus. Although that said, you know, I've heard um, of direct property being taken on by annuity providers recently, uh, and there's talk of they're looking at how, so, so. There's obviously an awful lot of property held in co-mingled pooled funds by. UK DB pension schemes, that is relatively illiquid and hard to get out of. And so insurers, I think, so as to facilitate transactions are looking at how at some point in future they might take that as well onto their balance sheet. So again, innovation is happening. It's changing all the time, but I wouldn't use in species as your base case. Thanks very much. Okay. And just had a wee warning to say five minutes left. So I will go on to my final slide, which is just to sum up, sum up, sorry, some of the key takeaways. So um, 
Hyman's view and mine is that you know liquid assets uh, they typically offer a, a good increased long-term return for a given level of risk. They still very much have a role to play in DB pension scheme asset strategies, though it's subject to scheme-specific practical constraints. Ultimately, your strategic benchmark and by extension, your allocation to liquid assets will depend on your chosen end game and your risk tolerance. Speaking of end games, there are many steps you can take to prepare in advance, and that includes aligning your investments in a sensible way. And that, that covers things like asset class exposure, liquidity, credit quality, the derivatives that you have in place, and your need for cash flow. And that is it. Thank you very much for listening and happy to take any questions. And I see one has come in. So con <laughs> secondary market turnover is actually well down this year by something of the order of 25%. So perhaps we're not back to, as I said, sensible market conditions just yet then, Porig. Uh, Peter, as an open DB scheme, we have been looking to invest in illiquids, but have avoided the secondary market because of concerns over manager having to sell underlying assets on a fire sale basis. So we're unsure what we're actually buying. Um, well, so I think it just speaks to doing really, really strong due diligence, Peter. Um, I know, so I advise a couple of LGPS schemes um, and we went to them and said, look, we know that there is this beyond the structural uh, de-risking of DB schemes. There is an immediate opportunity around liquidity in September and October of last year. Uh, that fund did due diligence on a number of, in this case, it was property pooled fund opportunities and decided, despite really material discounts to NAV, not to invest uh, following that due diligence, um, th both on a risk return trade off and on a worries over what the underlying assets might look like over the medium term. That was precisely our situation. Thank you for that. No problem. Cheers, Peter. Uh, I see that JQ is typing. JQ, do you want to unmute and um, just ask a question, or are you making well, a point? No, it's fine. It was just that the, the the challenge with the insurers piece is that they've all got their own internal models, which are all different to each other, and therefore their matching adjustment approaches mean that their views on assets are are can be can be um, um, a little different from each other, and that, those small differences can make a significant impact. And so this this issue of I, I liken it to Bernie the Bolt. Now you're too young for Bernie the Bolt, but it was um, a situation where someone had it was blindfolded and had to aim, shoot, fire kind of thing back in the day. For those who are old, you'll probably remember Bernie the Bolt. Question, Steve, do you remember Bernie the Bolt? I remember, sadly, yeah. Exactly. So there's a little <laughs> bit of that. It, it strikes me there's a little bit of that going on. So I just like 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 your views on the likelihood of a scheme being able to align itself with the liquid assets to meet the very the various and varying not varying the various well, well it may vary with the, with the with the uh, changes to solvency 2 or or, or your uk solvency um, piece going forward yeah so if, can i separate it out into two john yep. so first of all yeah you can massively over engineer it and i've pulled this slide up again because it just depends on how where you are on your journey and how close you're getting to that insurance transaction. If you're a couple of years out, then something broadly sensible like, and uh, you you know every scheme will be different, but 30% say uh, in investment grade corporate bonds on a buy and maintain basis, 70% in LDI and 95% hedged to in interest rates and inflation might be an insurer friendly portfolio. Right, because you've closed out most of your interest rate and inflation risk. You've got that exposure to corporate bond spreads, which is the the sort of if you look across the ten now bulk annuity provider portfolios, they all have an allocation to investment grade corporate bonds to varying degrees. And that's why so 30%, it's unlikely that it's going to be less than that, the allocation, you know, the, the sort of credit spread exposure. Then obviously the closer you get, whether it's you, you've narrowed it down to a short list of two or three bulk annuity providers that you're you're 
expecting to give you the best price. You can look at their investment strategies, start informally talking to them um, when, you, when you're getting closer. Then you can refine your strategy a bit more. It might be things like in your LDI portfolio, um, you might have ABS, right? Well, under the current Solvency 2, we know that insurers have no interest in asset-backed securities because they're really penalised uh, in their capital treatment. Um, so it makes sense to sell down the ABS in your LDI collateral and reduce some of your repo exposure that insurers aren't going to want either and in, instead invest in physical gilts and index link gilts to whatever degree you can. So it, don't over-engineer it when you're far away. When you get close, you can think about it a bit more. And when you get to asset lock, that's when you really do the like line by line work. But yes, your your point is um, be sensible in your approach, I think. Right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Brilliant, Ben. Thanks for your response. The next question, John. Uh, at the, we're just uh, over on slightly, but at this stage, I want to say thank you, big thank you to Ben for excellent presentation. Um, uh, you know, thank you for your comments and thanks for your questions. Uh, a great session. Um, as promised, Ben will send us the slideshow, uh, which we can send out to any um, uh, people or members that want it. So, uh, if that's all right with you, Ben, if you could send us the slides, that'd be great. Yep, and uh, really appreciate everybody's uh, input and time today and I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, so, uh, and thanks, Jim, for um, putting your thumb up, at least. So uh, I'll ask you a question. Well, Jim, join next week and we'll, uh, we'll unmute you and uh, try and get you to, uh, to ask a question. But uh, I'll, I'll try and set you up next week. But uh, thank you very much, Steve, Ben. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, we'll get the recording of this uh, out uh, this afternoon, hopefully, uh, onto the Pension Playpen um, site. And um, thank you all for, 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 for joining. Uh, as usual, uh, we pray for peace in the East. Uh, I cannot believe it's going to be August soon and we're still praying for peace in the East and um, that's still going on. Um, and we say it every week. Um, but, uh, you know, I wish you all a very um, happy end of the day. And uh, we'll hopefully see you at next session, which will be on the 1st of August, for goodness sake. So amazing. Uh, and that's probably in conversation with Henry Tapper. He doesn't know it yet, but I've set him up with someone. So there we go. So I um, hope you all enjoyed that. Thanks for the uh, for the time and the input, Ben. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, and as I say, the recording will be up. Um, if you like Playpen, then please share with others and get them to join. Um, if you're not on Playpen, please join. And, um, you know, we're um, you know very keen to innovate and to share ideas and to improve our industry, which is what Playpen is all about. So really appreciate your time, everybody, and um, absolutely fantastic. So, and Ben, if you could stay on for one minute, that would be- uh, Yeah, yeah, no worries. Good. Yeah, okay. Thank fantastic. you, everybody. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, JQ. Cheers. Cheers, Adrian. Thanks, Adrian, for joining for three seconds. Cheers, take care. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that, Ben, but Adrian Swales joined literally about a minute ago. <laughs> So, I, I was rather delayed. Sorry. Yeah. About that. All right, Adrian. I was just warning you. Right. I, I, I watched the recording. You watched the recording. Yeah, and we'll send you the slideshow, Adrian. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Have right. a great day. Cheers, yeah, guys. Take care. Cheers, Cheers, Andre. Cheers, yeah, right. Cheers, Ben. Thanks for that. That was, uh, I think, good. Did you enjoy it, number one? Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So, um, what we will usually do is just do one minute summary of what today was all about. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, what was today all about? Um, what were the key points? And what do you think was the best question? So that two things, a summary of today, and what do you think was the best question? Uh, okay, so summary of today, um, illiquid assets have been in the news for DB schemes over the last year or so. Uh, we think they absolutely have a role to play in DB scheme investment strategies going forward. And it's nice to see that uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer agrees based on his Mansion House speech. Um, it is different for every scheme. So it'll depend on things like risk tolerance, return requirement and practical constraints. Uh, and one of those practical constraints is the end game you're aiming for. You can plan for that well in advance, including what your allocation to liquids might be uh, and other things like the quality of your credit assets, 
what asset classes you should be investing in more widely, your use of derivatives and the cash that you need to pay the benefits, which is the most important thing. Yeah, OK. And the best question today, um, maybe, you know, um, in your opinion. So I liked John's question, to be honest, but I don't know if that at the very end there, just because it, and I'm worried now that's playing to my corporate DB consulting mind, but I would, you know, it, you can over-engineer how you prep for a risk transfer transaction. And uh, I think that's only going to become more important. You know, how do you invest in an insurer-friendly way yeah. going forward? Yeah. So I'll go with that one. Okay. And finally, question, uh, a bright future for illiquids, yes or no? Uh, a sustained future for illiquids, which I think is a positive result based on the challenges that have been put to the uh, sector over the last wee while. Fantastic, brilliant. Okay, Ben, that's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it and uh, we'll get you back maybe six months or, or whatever, um, see how the market's going, see what's going on in the DB market, see what yeah, direction the travel is. Um, and uh, yeah, um, really, really um, grateful for your presentation. It's really good. No, really um, enjoyed it, thank you. And uh, um, yeah, it was, Excellent. It was excellent. So thank you very, very much. Um, and now you're a member, then, you know, please join other sessions if they're of interest to you, you know. So yeah, we'll um, do. Yeah. Um, I'll and, take a look um, out. Have a look at the library if there are any other sessions that are quite good, I think. So there's a few in there. So, but uh, yeah, good. Brilliant. All right, Ben. Thanks very much. Enjoy your rest of your day. Cheers. Thanks enjoy the rest of your holiday. Cheers, Cheers Steve. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.